Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining me tonight as we talk about lumbering and logging in Gravenhurst between 1870 and 1910. Before we begin, I'd like to read the land acknowledgement statement on behalf of Gravenhurst Public Library and Gravenhurst Archives. We acknowledge that the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, and the Métis people were and are still the keepers and caretakers of the land and waters upon which the town of Gravenhurst now sits, which is covered by the Williams Treaty and the One Dish with One Spoon Treaty. We are deeply grateful for the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples who have shaped and strengthened this community for the benefit of future generations. And we are committed to moving forward in the spirit Probably of reconciliation and well, respect. I never get sound at this point. Tonight, we're going to be talking about something that I've termed the Lumberman's Waltz. If you've watched the NFB, NFB film or you've listened to Kate and Anna McGargle singing, you know that it's really called the Log Driver's Waltz. But I thought it was better to term it the Lumberman's Waltz because it includes a, a, um, a greater group of, uh, of logging people, people working in the logging industry. I'll just give you a quick moment of, of background here. My name is Judy Humphreys. If you haven't um, uh, seen me or heard me before, I I have some uh, background in this. Uh oh, I think we've got some echoes going on. I'm not sure where that's from. Okay, let's try that again. My name is Judy Humphreys. My husband's grandfather was a lumberman, a logger on the Ottawa River. And I've held a, a great interest in the whole world of logging and lumbering ever since I first learned about him and about uh, the way that he uh, worked um, before and after he went to the First World War. <clears throat> he used to drive logs down the Madawaska River into Arn Pryor and his wife lived on the Madawaska River and he would ride a log into the shore, step off the log, push it off back out into the, uh, the boom and walk up the lawn and into the house, have a cup of tea with his wife and then go out, pick up a log and go on back down as he had been going. I've always been intrigued with that story. It's, it's so romantic and so interesting to me. And I'm hoping that you will find that the pictures that I show you tonight from a vast collection of photographs that we have in the archives from the logging and lumbering mills of Gravenhurst, I'm hoping that you'll find them both romantic and interesting as we go. A whole district would be laid out by government in something called timber berths to be sold to lumber companies. Timber berths were areas that were licensed to either an individual or to a company to cut lumber, but only within that set of limits. Timber licenses were sold by auction to lumbermen, allowing them to cut over any uncleared land on settlers holdings and to build roads to get in and out through the settlers land. So the free grants land um, had a few wrinkles um, and those wrinkles caused a bit of hard feeling between settlers and lumbermen. A timber ranger or a timber cruiser would be hired because he knew the good stands of pine close to streams. He would climb a tall tree and scan the horizon for a vein of darker pine through the dense forest. And then he would estimate its size. Based on his estimation, the company would bid on timber licenses. Later, much more scientific methods were used to do this estimating. But for now, we're talking about a man on top of a tree. The timber dues that were collected by the government on all pine trees, because pine trees were the only trees that mattered. Believe it or not, hardwoods didn't matter. Nobody wanted them particularly. And so pine was the uh, lumber that was reserved to the crown. Nobody else could cut it unless they had a license to do so. And the dues that were collected by the government on all pine trees taken paid all the costs of government administration for the entire province of Ontario year by year. In the beginning, it was simply settlers cutting all the hardwood and softwood, pine, whatever it was. 
and they could cut anything that they needed to without charge, providing they were either clearing the land for a house or clearing the land for um, some kind of agriculture. Logging bees would be held, and this is a, an old drawing of a logging bee in Muskoka, where all the settlers would get together to help each other to clear land, maybe for agriculture or for building a barn. But once we actually got to the point where um, we were starting to build roads, like the corduroy road that you've seen before when I've done talks, um, that's the road running north from Aurelia in 1844, made totally of logs, or the plank road um, a little later, about 20 years later, this is showing the plank road going over the Severn River, the Severn River Bridge. As soon as you got into the point where you needed that amount of wood, immediately we knew there was going to have to be a lumber industry set up in Muskoka to uh, develop the progress and, and um, the settlement of the land. That logging industry would come with all kinds of, of things. For a starter, you would be sending men out into the forest for an entire winter. They would leave in the fall. They would not plan to get home until the spring drive was over. So in fact, they were going to have to live, eat, work, play right here. And I'm showing you the first kind of shanty in which they would live called a cambus or a cambus shanty. Cambus being the French word for it. And the cambus shanty was in fact one that had a fire, that's the cambus. The cambus was the fire in the center of the room built on sand, a great big square open pit fire. In the roof, they cut an enormous opening. And you can see that I've shown it could be four feet. It could be as large as 10 foot square, depending on the size of the shanty. The roof was made by putting two hollow logs together. You took one log and turned it right side up, the other log inside out and down, and you, you um, put them together, filled the, filling the chinks with moss and so on. The canvas would provide all kinds of heat, a fire for cooking, uh, and so on. And there it is, the Cambus fire. Men would hang their clothes above it. You can see a pair of boots, I think, up in the ceiling of this one. But in other photographs and drawings, you can see them hanging their clothes, their wet clothes up to dry. In actual fact, they slept in their clothes. So something would have to be pretty wet before they hung it up. And they had time to dry out before they actually <clears throat> went to bed to sleep. So most of the time they didn't really have to hang their clothes up. That giant hole would let the smoke out of the Cambus fire. And eventually by say 1900, shanties moved from having a Cambus fire to a wood stove for both cooking and heating. The shanty itself, if we just go back for a moment, had a very small door. You can see that the cook actually fills the entire doorway. This is to um, keep a maximum of heat in and a maximum of cold out. Um, there would be a barrel of water and a couple of, of um, uh, pails beside the door on one side for washing up, a grindstone on the other side uh, for a sharpening axis, and there'd also be a pile of wood. And people were expected to bring in a stick of wood when they were coming in. As I've mentioned, the shanty men were going to sleep in their clothes. They would create a bed on those platforms that you see on the left-hand side of balsam branches, and they would cover those beds with a blanket, and then the man would have two blankets to put over himself. Two men slept on each of those platforms, so they slept together there. Not perhaps the most conducive for um, good health and sleeping because a, any diseases transmitted would be transmitted to everyone. Most of them suffered from smoke-filled eyes most of the time in the Cambus, despite that enormous opening in the roof. So not always the healthiest of environment, shall we say. Cook was one of the most important men in the camp and one of the best paid. In fact, he ranked just below the foreman in both his importance and his pay. 
There was no alcohol allowed in camps whatsoever. And that would probably be a surprise for some people who've heard all about these rowdy shantymen and, um, and would assume that therefore they were rowdy in camp. No, they weren't. They played hard when they left camp on the drive, but they certainly had no alcohol allowed. If they were found with alcohol, they were dismissed. They were sent home. Men spent the evening um, drying out their boots and their clothes, sharpening and cleaning their tools, playing cards, playing some other games or all kinds of games that they played. But Teamsters had to be up really early and on their rigs by four o'clock in the morning in the dark. <laughs> so they were in fact early to bed. I'm showing you two kinds of axes on the left-hand side, the pole axe being the most popular. I know that that word or that term pole axe is something that all kinds of people have used. The pole is the thick end on one end, it's the left end of this axe there, and then the blade is the sharp end <clears throat> where business takes place. Um, loggers were pretty picky about their axes. Um, they would find the type that suited them best, they worried about the length of the handle, the weight of the pole, that heavy part to balance with the blade and so on. A lot of injuries occurred with axes. Men cut off toes, they um, opened gashes in their legs. The best cure would be administered by the cook for these deep gashes. I don't think it could do much about losing a toe, but um, they would in fact um, create a poultice made out of chewing tobacco. They would warm it up to make the poultice and then jam it into the wound to draw out the poison. Many men who signed up for the First World War um, later on would in fact sign up missing a toe or more toes than one and uh, often were not able to do the marching that would be required as a result. You can see in the photograph here that one man is sharpening his ox while the other man is turning the wheel to make the grindstone turn. And he would get that ax to exactly the kind of, of blade that he wanted based on the kind of felling that he was going to have to do. Until the mid 1870s, ax men did all the felling of trees and they were always filled, felled sorry, by pole axes. So in fact, that was really the hard way to um, fell a tree. Uh, after about 1875 or so, um, the crosscut saw would become available for lumbermen. And they could then use it to lumbermen to a crosscut saw to do the cutting. It was a lot faster than the pole axe and maybe a lot safer. Um, I've shown you a, a sort of a close up of the crosscut saw. Most people will know exactly what that is, but there were two kinds of teeth, if you like, on the saw. The teeth were the actual cutting um, uh, pieces, and they were the ones that are sort of thicker. And the little things in there are called rakers, and they were used to clear out all the bits of wood and sawdust that would accumulate, particularly if there was some sap in the tree or whatever. Um, they would be sticky, and um, that those rakers would clean that out. It took us a man with a special talent sharpen a crosscut saw, all very well for a lumberman to actually sharpen his own ax, but he certainly could not sharpen a crosscut saw. So it took a filer to do that. Um, he was a special um, um, man. He, he had a, a good salary, good position. Um, he could do about between 12 and 15 crosscut saws in a day. A crew would always have a couple of saws, one saw that they would be using, and then the other saw that would be in the hands of the filer to get sharpened up for the following day. This is a photograph of, of um, I don't know, maybe about 30, 35 men there with their tools, their lumbering tools, and they're posing for a photograph. Now, that would have to be on a Sunday. You did not, in fact, work on a Sunday. In fact, even if you sharpened your ax on a Sunday, it was believed rather suspiciously, I guess, um, that you would be likely to cut yourself badly on Monday as a result of having done that job of sharpening your ax or your, your saw. So these men have all posed for a Sunday afternoon picture. They've got all of their tools of the trade there. And uh, of course they're holding that pose for the length of time that it would take 
to expose the photograph. I like this one. Here, we've got a number of things to comment on. For a starter, these are not Cambu shanties anymore. These shanties would be heated by a, a boxwood stove and they would have a stove for cooking as well. The Teamsters who are caught on camera here as they prepare their teams of horses to head out um, would normally have left before dawn. So whether this is another Sunday picture and they've just brought their horses out for the sake of a photograph, that's sort of what I'm guessing. Because in fact, the first Teamster would leave at four o'clock in the morning with his rig and the rest would follow at about 30 minute intervals, which was the length of time that it took to load a sleigh and then get it to the point where the wood would be dumped, the logs would be dumped. <clears throat> Swampers were already out on the trail. Swampers were an unskilled group of men who were maybe just learning the lumbering trade. Their whole um, job was to cut trails through the bush, ice them down, and then prepare hot sand for the hills to stop runaway teams. We'll see Sawyer's or Swampers story in action in a moment. The cutters and Sawyer's are already away to the cut area, the area where they're going to be cutting logs. The filer is busy sharpening his saws. The cook is preparing food to be cooked, and he has a boy to help with dishes and scraps and clean up. The blacksmith will be in the stable, um, shoeing horses, repairing reins, repairing runners on sleighs or making new ones, making pikes for pike poles or the claw on peavies. And he too would have a boy to help with the unskilled jobs like mucking out the stables. Manure, by the way, everything was used. So manure was used to fill holes in the road. Or he'd be working on barrels to be filled with waters to ice, water to ice down the roads. I have one of each of these in my um, cabin up north. We have my husband's grandfather's pike pole. Uh, we have a peavy uh, and a can hook. And you'll see that peavies and can hooks are pretty similar looking beasts, but peavies had a sharp pointed end, whereas a can hook had a flat uh, blunt end. Both were used to move logs both were used to break up log jams, roll logs into place, and all were made in the forge by the blacksmith and attached to wooden handles of varying length, depending upon the height of the person who was gonna be using them. <clears throat> the pike on a pike pole was also made in the forge by a blacksmith, but the pike pole itself would be between 10 and 15 feet in length. They were used to drive logs down streams and across water, and they were also essential to the lumberman's waltz. On the left, you see a color who would eventually be called a scaler. His job, and it was specialized again, was to measure the um, girth of the log and record it, and then to swing the scamper or marker, the timber marker, um, and swing it so that it left a mark on the end of each log sort of like branding cattle. It showed ownership because the logs would become mixed with other um, uh, logs from other uh, uh, camps. And you had to be able to sort out your own logs so you didn't lose any. I'm showing you um, the cipher here for uh, the Snyder Lumber Company, that big S, and the MD for Mickel Diamond on the end of their logs. Another very specialized job, well paid, was the top loader. He was the man who created the load on each sleigh, knowing how to arrange the logs to best fit and stay in place. A block and tackle would be used, and I think you can tell there um, on the right hand side, you might be able to see the block, and then the tackle is around the, the log, and you've got a couple of men who, with their can hooks, um, are pushing up to the top loader, who again with his can hook is, is bringing the logs into the places where he wants to put them. Very specialized kind of work, work, work being done there.
You can see the logs piled up to the left and the uh, sleigh waiting with two dark horses on the right. These men are preparing um, a, a load, a regular load of logs, um, or in fact, they may be going to create a brag load. Now, let me just tell you, a brag load was created for a lot of reasons. Sometimes there was a competition between um, logging camps. And although the other loggers didn't have to be there from the camp to see what went on on a brag load, in actual fact, either a photograph could be taken or the stories would spread. And so in fact, um, a competition arose. How many logs could you load on a sleigh? Well, we loaded and then it went on and on. Sometimes they just loaded brag loads for the fun of it. I don't know that anyone asked the horses just how much fun they would be having, but a regular load of 25 to 30 logs might weigh upwards of 20 tons and it would have to be moved between two and three miles on that sleigh pulled by two horses. There's a brag load. This one has approximately 50 logs on it. So you do the math, 50 times 20 tons will give you the weight of that brag load being pulled by those two white horses. You'll see a regular load is on a sleigh behind. That's the one that's going to weigh roughly around 20 tons. This one's going to weigh just a bit more than that. And then there's this one, which was a record brag load. Only I suspect that rather than the people who put it on the sleigh, it's the horses that ought to be bragging because they in fact were able to move that sleigh full of logs and they moved it three miles. <laughs> Every time I look at that, I think, oh my goodness, those poor horses. This is more modern day. This looks like it would be maybe in the 1920s or so. And it, I put it in here only to show you that you can't take the boy out of the man. Um, these two guys are gonna ride that log right to the top and they just are so proud of themselves for doing it. They both have pike poles in their hands to balance themselves on that log. What you're looking at here are swampers. Swampers were those guys, as I mentioned, who cleared um, a pathway through the dense forest, creating a logging road or a log hauling road. But it had to be iced down so that the runners would run on that road and so that the horses could actually pull the load. So what you're looking at here is what would be called in the fire service, a water tender. You're looking at a wagon with a water load on it and you can see a barrel on the right hand side. They had to do the icing down very, very carefully because you could end up um, icing the sleigh in place to the point where both the horse's hooves and the sleigh itself were frozen in one spot. So they had to learn how to ice down very, very well so that they didn't in fact um, get the timing all wrong and freeze the entire thing in one spot. Here you can see a swamper is spreading sand on an icy hill. He kept a, um, a fire going nearby. I can't see it in this photograph. And he would be heating up sand in pails constantly on the fire so that the sand when it hit the snow would actually melt it and give a real grip for the uh, sleigh runners. If you take a look at the teamster who's sitting on the top of this load, you can tell that despite the fact he has his hands on the reins, he has one foot braced on a log beside him and he's ready to bail because if he lost control of a sleigh and horses on a runaway sleigh down a hill, he would be killed unless he got out of there really fast. So he would bail, he would literally jump to the side <clears throat> and then you had to just worry about what would happen to the horses because if that sleigh was going fast enough, it would overtake the horses and would kill them it would kill anyone in the past. So in fact, they had to get out of the way quickly. Most of the time they were able to go down hills that had been properly sanded. 
um, and enjoy the ride down. There's two guys sitting behind the Teamster here, just going for a ride by the looks of things. And that would be sort of your normal load there. That's the one that would weigh roughly 20 tons. If a Teamster lost control though on the way downhill, um, it would be a uh, breakneck. Logs would be taken on those sleighs to a pile near where they were going to be shot down a hill into the lake below. The skidway, as it was called, that pile um, would hold a whole group of, of logs um, and they would eventually be sending them down these chutes. They would build a chute so that the logs were not damaged and so that they didn't get hung up uh, in something like a steep um, a hill full of rocks or whatever. This is in fact the South Falls um, in, in Muskoka. It's just, got, just past the airport and now called Muskoka Falls, but it, it was called the South Falls. We got our power in Gravenhurst from the South Falls. And you can see a close up of what a chute looked like. They had to build those. And then you can see what it looked like in winter on the right hand side. And then finally, what it looked like in spring. So in the winter, it would be iced. In the spring, it would be flowing with water and the logs were put into those chutes and sent down into the water below. Sometimes they were sent down onto the ice, which had not yet gone out. So that when the ice did go out, the logs would start to float. Pine, of course, floats beautifully. I've called this coming through. Um, I suspect that that would be what they would call out just as they release the water from that little dam that they've created. The loggers would create a small dam on a stream to hold back the logs and the water until they had enough water to create a sort of flood condition, if you like, and then would provide enough water to carry the logs into the lake below. The loggers would be waiting on both sides to break up any jams that might occur to straighten a log out so that it was going down and wasn't going to cause a jam and so on. And they've all got their pike poles in their hands waiting. Uh, the dam has been opened up and the water is flowing and the logs are about to come. <laughs> this is a very famous sketch called Driving the Logs. <clears throat> and it shows loggers on the drive with their pike poles directing and forcing the logs ahead of them. This, is take, this was done on the Ottawa River. And I like to think of my husband's grandfather being one of those men um, riding a log and pushing the logs ahead of him down the Ottawa. It's a very famous sketch. I actually have a color version of it in my living room because I like it so much. In this photograph, the loggers are standing on the boom that they've created to corral the logs and bring them together into a sort of manageable, movable unit. They're actually standing on the boom, but the boom is simply a log attached to another log, attached to another log in succession, end to end to end. So they're standing on one log and they look so incredibly comfortable standing there. You would swear they were standing on a sidewalk in downtown Gravenhurst, but in fact, each is standing on a log with his pike pole in his hands. In this photo as well, you can see just how comfortable they look and you can get a good look at their pike poles. Um, they've stopped and posed for a picture. Uh, photographers like to get in if they could into a, a logging camp and um, take photographs like this because they wanted um, not only to sell them to, to the uh, men they were, were photographing, but also um, to create the kind of romantic interest in logging and lumbering that they felt uh, they should have. Here you can see that Muskoka River on the left-hand side is completely filled with logs. Sometimes it would be filled for four miles in length with all of those logs so close together that you could walk from one side of the river to the other without getting your foot wet. On the right-hand side, the Islander 
is coming through, hoping to find an open channel to get through. Um, and by the way, just a note here, we are placking, Municipal Heritage Committee is placking the Islander Wheelhouse down at Grayson Speed on the 18th of May at two o'clock. The invitation is up on, on Facebook and uh, we'd be very happy to have you there to take a look at the Islander Wheelhouse, which you can see at the top of the Islander there in that photograph. In these three photographs, you can see what really gave that idea of a lumberman or a log driver's waltz to the people who told the stories and wrote the songs. These log drivers are burling or log rolling as they move down the river. The man at the far right would appear to me to be the perfect choice for a, a dancing partner. Uh, he looks like he is uh, so comfortable, but also so graceful. And he doesn't even seem to have a pike pole in his hands. So I would nominate him as my partner in the next dance. A verse and chorus from the log driver's waltz goes like this. When the drive's nearly over, I, this is a girl talking by the way, when the drive's nearly over, I like to go down and watch all the lads as they work on the river. I know that come evening, they'll all be in town and we all like to waltz with the log driver. For he goes burling down and down white water. That's where the log driver learns to step lightly. Yes, burling down and down white water, the log driver's waltz pleases girls completely. All of the verses in that song are quite fun. And in the end, despite the fact that her parents are urging her to dance with lawyers and uh, doctors and so on, she finds that they all have basically two left feet and she goes and finds her log driver whom she decides in the end that she would really like to marry. Um, <laughs> and so in fact, she will always be pleased because she will be able to dance with him forever. As I say, do take a look on YouTube at the NFB film. The NFB film is wonderful. The NFB cartoon is equally fun. And if you go on to iTunes, you can listen to Kate and Anna McGargle singing the song. But where were all these logs going? First, I've mentioned that they're going to a skidway and then down those chutes to the ice below or maybe to the open water below. And then they're being driven down the lake and into Muskoka Bay to the waiting mills. My husband, the geographer, um, did a couple of maps for me and I was very happy he did. This first one just gives you sort of a quick visual of how many um, logging and shingle mills, lumber mills were on Muskoka Bay and over to the right at the top there on Gull Lake shoreline um, at any particular time. I'm gonna say that this is probably <clears throat> well, it's probably about 1878, 1880, um, when this, this set of mills would have existed at that spot. I think if you can imagine the sound of all of the machines, the circular saws, whirring in those uh, lumber mills and shingle mills, planing mills, and all whirring at the same time, starting at seven o'clock in the morning when the whistle blew and working through sometimes till eight o'clock at night, you can only imagine the sound that would be created. The smell of pine, I love it. I don't know whether everyone does, but the smell of pine would be all through the air in West Gravenhurst and certainly probably wafting up the hill into Gravenhurst as well. The next map, We've labeled all of those mills by the first owner, in the case of the one at the top left, Taylor, um, who um, owned that. <laughs> Mr. Taylor was the man who built the Albion Hotel in 1878, 1879. Uh, his wife told him that he best sell that hotel uh, because otherwise she was afraid he might become its best customer. So in fact, he sold the hotel and went into the lumber business. And his name was George Washington Taylor, a lovely name. Um, and he then had that mill at the very top 
on the west side of Muskoka Bay. Eventually that um, mill would be owned by the Snyder Company. Wherever you see a slash, you see the original owner, or perhaps in some cases, the actual builder of the mill, Joseph Chu, and then the subsequent or the final owner. In the case of the Chu mill, it was owned by several people and companies before it got to Rathbun. But in fact, Chu and Rathbun would be the, the bookends to that particular mill. <clears throat> you notice as well that the um, mills on Gull Lake, two were shingle mills, one was an actual lumber mill. One was at the end of Church Street, that's Fraser's Mill. And two were at the end of Brock Street, one on the left, one on the right, or the north and south of Brock Street, but right on the water. And you can see that they were in fact shingle mills. I think it's absolutely stunning to think about how many mills lumber and shingle and planing operated in and around Gravenhurst between 1870 and 1910. I was able to list over 23 mills and yet I know that there are at least two or three that I just couldn't find the names for. They weren't particularly prominent ones but nonetheless <clears throat> they were mills and remember as well that some of the mills actually were built at the uh, place where the Hawk Rock enters the, uh, the lake, Lake Muskoka, or they were built, um, uh, yeah, sort of in, in places where if they couldn't get a, a spot on the bay, um, a place that would in fact suit them um, to build a mill. I'm just gonna give you a quote here. By 1878, there were a total of 17 mills in Gravenhurst, which were then turning out more shingles, more lath, and more saw and lumber than any other town in Ontario other than Ottawa and Midland. I can only talk about a very few mills tonight because of our time constraints, but um, I am going to just mention to you that there are all of those mills that could be explored for anyone who is interested in taking a closer look. Using the white mill as it was known, um, which was a chew mill eventually owned by Rathbun, I'm just gonna show you some of the important parts of a, of a mill on the exterior. The sawdust burner on the left-hand side uh, provided a spectacular show at night, sort of akin to the dumping of slag at Sudbury, if you know that. Um, sawdust and small bits of wood were burned in that sawdust burner to generate heat in the boiler to provide steam power to the machinery. So again, nothing was wasted. Um, in fact, sawdust and bits were all burned for fuel. In the middle of that picture, you can see a jack ladder going up into the mill. The jack ladder had a chain on it that was endless. It, it was you know, completely attached in a circle and it constantly revolved around the ladder, moving lumber, uh, sorry, not lumber, moving logs out of the out of the water up into the mill to become lumber. And then just past that jack ladder and the mill buildings at the south, um, you can see the smokestack tall and slender. Every mill had at least one smokestack, sometimes as many as two. Um, and they were to get rid of all the smoke um, that would be generated from the boiler and the fires and so on. The log boom is right here in front of us, and you can see that it's simply created by attaching by chain one log to the, the end of one log to the end of the next log, creating a boom. And close to us would be where a whole group of logs would be. They've left an open channel here down the middle of the bay, which they usually tried to do for steamers. Although there are stories of some steamers being trapped for a number of hours in a log. <laughs> mess out in the middle of the lake or maybe even um, coming down the river or coming down um, the bay until somebody could get in there and move them. I'm going to talk about three, I guess we're going to call them lumber barons or three at least lumber men who had companies big enough that they um, actually made a sort of a um, 
a headline, I suppose, in all the lumber journals and so on. And the first one I'm going to mention is Edward Wilkes Rathbun, who in fact came from Deseronto. Um, he was in fact a lumber baron in his own right in Deseronto. He owned lumber mills and he owned lumber rights and berths and licenses all over Ontario. He had all kinds of money and all kinds of success. Um, he came to Gravenhurst uh, just around um, 1901 and um, <laughs> we're a little bit too late by about 20 years for the boom that was happening here. Uh, they purchased the white mill in 1901 from the Longford Company president, who was William Thompson at the time, but they operated it only until 1908. Their red mill was the former Peter Coburn mill right at the very bottom of Muskoka Bay. And they were called the red mill and the white mill because that's the way they were painted. I have in fact included Joseph Claremont, Mark Claremont's great, great grandfather, I'm thinking, um, in the middle picture because he was brought in by Rathbun uh, from uh, the company in Deseronto um, to manage the Rathbun mills, the two mills here. And he stayed. He did not go back when they closed the mills in 1908. Um, he stayed and on the right, you see his living room and his family in the living room. Um, again, holding the pose long enough for that picture to take. Um, but he in fact stayed, became a mayor in Gravenhurst and was involved in the community. White Mill, again, at the top right was the original um, site of the Chew Mill. It was rebuilt after a fire destroyed it um, in 1899 by William Thompson and then sold to the Rathbun Company in 1901, but only run until 1908. The red mill is shown in the picture at the bottom right. Um, this is taken about 1900. You can see all the men standing on the, on the, on the roof of the uh, area where the lumber would be stored and uh, hoping to get into the picture. And there's an advertisement from Rathbun, which marries together the head office in Deseronto and the Gravenhurst Mills advertises the kind of stuff that they would have been selling. Second lumber baron or um, important lumbering figure that I thought it was worth drawing attention to was E.W.B. Snyder. He was heavily involved in industry uh, in the area in which he lived, which was basically um, <clears throat> around Waterloo. And <laughs> he was a man of great prominence in Ontario, but mainly in Southern Ontario. Uh, he was most particularly interested in the production of hydroelectric power in Ontario. And what he wanted to do was pull together all the municipal electrical utilities in Southern Ontario under one sort of umbrella management team, which would eventually become Ontario Hydro. In 1890, he decided too to get in on this lumber boom that was going on <clears throat> in Muskoka, in Gravenhurst, but not personally. Um, the Snyder Company purchased the Taylor Mill, which is that one built by George Washington Taylor up at the northern end of the of the line of mills on the west side of the uh, Muskoka Bay. He bought that mill and he set up his son Aldred to manage it. Aldred in fact decided he wanted to live in Gravenhurst and he built a beautiful home, which I'm showing to you here um, on John Street. It would have been located just across that little piece of Brown Street um, from Bethune House. And if you can imagine it, it was torn down um, in order to make room for Brown's Beverages garages, um, which are located where that house stood. <clears throat> I always think what a shame it's been that over the years we've lost so many beautiful homes in Gravenhurst. The Snyder Lumber Mill, this is a picture taken in 1895. Um, the Snyder Lumber Mill was very um, prosperous in some regards. Um, the Snyders did nothing by halves. Um, they had all the latest equipment, but Aldred particularly uh, was so frustrated 
because he needed rolling train cars to move his lumber to market. And the Grand Trunk Railway was chronically short of cars and engines, mostly due to the number of train wrecks they experienced. Their trains ran off the rails left and right constantly. And so, you know, a wrecked train engine was going to have to be rebuilt. Wrecked train cars were going to have to be rebuilt. And there were never enough train cars to even begin to move out the lumber that was being amassed by these big mills. <clears throat> Snyder was also, um, Aldred, was also the first um, company to cut hemlock um, for the wood, not for the bark for the tanning mills, which of course we know was the, uh, the way in which leather was tanned by, by hemlock bark, but in fact, to cut the hemlock as a wood of value in itself. No matter that he did that, um, all Snyder operations ceased by 1908, although they did retain their home on John Street for quite a while as a summer vacation place. We have a huge collection of Snyder lumber photographs because many of you will perhaps have known Bill and Helen Snyder who lived here in Gravenhurst. Uh, Bill would be the great grandson, I guess, of EWB. Um, and in fact, um, was a musician of some note. His wife, Helen, actually worked in the public library here as a library clerk. And he donated all of his photographs and slides um, to Gravenhurst Archives. You can see that this lumber yard stretches as far as the eye can see, but you might be wondering what those funny looking tracks are in the center. And in actual fact, the lumber yards were interlaced with tramways for loading and unloading lumber. In this original photograph from 1896 of the Snyder lumber yard, you can see just how far that lumber really went. And on the right hand side, you can see a tram car. Uh, I think somebody's leaning up against it there. And it has a load of lumber on the top of it. It's going to be uh, wheeled down into the right spot and the lumber will be easily able to be uh, slid off onto a pile from the right height of that tram car. So that was the whole idea behind the tramways, the tracks that are laid there that you can see, and also uh, the tram cars. In this photograph, you can see the Snyder Mill and the Thompson Mill, both in here, and you get an idea of how much lumber was waiting to be shipped out. If you can see on the left-hand side, those massive piles of lumber, um, it looks to me like that might actually be sawn lumber in, in four foot lengths, and maybe the same sort of thing over to the right. Um, they look like they might actually even be almost like cordwood. But in the center, you can see the piles of sawn lumber. That lumber is not doing anyone any good sitting in a yard. In fact, it's waiting uh, for a fire to occur so that it can really get it going and burn out everything, including all of the mills and all of the wood. So getting it onto trains and getting it out was the thing that had to be done. And you can only imagine the frustration that these lumbermen must have felt at not being able to get trains uh, when they had contracted for those trains to be brought in and get their lumber to market. And of course, every time their lumber didn't get to market, somebody else's lumber did and took um, their spot and maybe became the, the lumber of choice in a company. Finally, and certainly not least, Charles Mickle is truly the real lumber baron of Gravenhurst. Neither Rathbun nor Snyder, Snyder were really invested in Gravenhurst or in the lumber industry in Gravenhurst for the long haul. Both of them bailed pretty, pretty quickly after about 10 years in each case. Only Charles Mickle lived here and participated fully in the life of Gravenhurst community. He came here in 1877 with his wife, Emma, from Cargill, Ontario. Uh, if you kind of know Bruce County and so on over there, that's sort of roughly where it is, Gray County probably more likely to set up a lumber business. That's really what he wanted to do. He was elected town councillor. He was elected mayor several times. Mayors and councillors were elected annually, 
not every four years, annually. And he was elected a number of times. It was he who made the deal with William Gage to bring the first of four tuberculosis sanatoriums to Gravenhurst in 1897. That contributed to the next, oh, I guess probably uh, 90 years of development in Gravenhurst by the time Muskoka Regional Center was closed. It was also Mickle who caused the Opera House to be built in 1901, despite the fact that cynics labeled it Mickle's Folly. The photograph on the right is showing the wedding of his daughter Bertha to a man named Howard Kane from Newmarket. And it took place at the Mickle home on Bay Street called Rosehurst. And it took place in 1907. You know that that is a heritage home that has been now converted into um, uh, not apartments, but condos really, I believe. And um, it's built on three lots. It was a huge, enormous property at one time, built on five, maybe six lots uh, in the town. A beautiful home, but also a huge yard that was used regularly for all kinds of community functions like strawberry socials and putting on plays and doing all of that sort of thing. Emma Mickle was somebody who believed that the women who were raising children in those lumber areas in Mickletown and in West Gravenhurst needed a break. And she would get out her, her little boat um, called the Bertha M and <clears throat> uh, named after her daughter and would take out a whole group of women on, on that boat um, for a picnic. And they would go to an island. They would have a picnic for the afternoon. She would have gotten somebody to care for the children and uh, just give these women um, a day away, um, a, a day to sort of enjoy and relax. This is the first uh, called lumber mill. At first, when um, Charles Mickle came here in 1877, he partnered with a man named William Tate in a mill on the west side of Muskoka Bay. In 1879, he purchased the mill outright from Tate and um, unfortunately later it did burn down in 1889, as did, I have to say, most of the mills at some time or another burned down and were rebuilt or not. You can actually see here um, two things, uh, maybe the double smokestack that I've mentioned before, you can see the jack ladder going up into the mill. You can see the other um, gangway that's going up, perhaps taking the sawdust up to the sawdust burner, or perhaps taking um, the um, finished uh, wood out. In 1884, Charles Mickle forged a partnership with a financier in Barrie called Nathaniel Diamond. He needed an influx or an inflow of money so that he could expand his lumber holdings and buy more timber bursts or timber licenses um, because he had to keep moving farther and farther and farther afield. As you can well imagine, all of the land around Gravenhurst was gradually logged out and all that was left standing with, you know, a whole lot of two foot tall, or in some cases, five foot tall stumps. So they had to keep going farther and farther afield. They had to go to auctions to purchase new lumber licenses and lumber berths. <clears throat> Mickle Diamond built the new mill, as they like to call it, in 1886, and you see it here. They added in 1894, a planing mill to this new mill. And this combination mill is the one that would survive into the 1920s, or actually, almost into the early 30s. In 1900, Charles Mickle acquired the de Blackier uh, lumber mill next to that first tape mill that he owned. He turned the de Blackier um, mill into a shingle mill. It had been a lumber mill before. You'll notice that there is a group of little boys all lining the ground below. And you might be thinking to yourself that the men have brought um, it's, it's sort of like take a child to work day, but no, not true. This would be in the summer holidays. These little boys were no doubt working in the lumber mill or outside the lumber mill, doing things like piling and fetching and so on. And if they were nine or 10, 
and strong enough, they could be hired and they could work for any number of cents a day or a week. So all of those little guys there, some of whom appear not to be wearing any shoes, um, are in fact employees of Mickle Diamond Shingle Mill and loving it. Mickle Diamond in 1889 produced the following amounts in his mill per day, 120,000 feet of lumber, 60,000 shingles, and 50,000 feet of lath per day in his mills. By 1891, he would employ 300 men in his camps in the Gravenhurst section alone, because in fact, Mickle Diamond had mills in Bradford, they had a mill in Barrie. Um, they had mills in a variety of places, but we're just talking about Gravenhurst here. When Charles Meckel died in November, 1929, it was said that his companies or he himself had cut between 500 and 600 million feet of lumber in his lifetime. The last Meckel mill closed completely, although they'd been closing down since about 1925. Um, but it closed completely in 1933 when Charles Mickle's son, his only son, Charlie Jr., was killed in a car accident on what is now Highway 11. Um, when his son died, um, uh, Charles Mickle himself was already dead. When the son died, the lumber business was simply closed up, and that was that. To my mind, Charles Mickle is really the father of Gravenhurst. His contributions to this community have been lasting and they speak eloquently, I think, about a man who loved his family and built first a home for them really close to the lumber mills, didn't show you that one, but when it burned down, built that beautiful home for his wife, Emma, um, valued um, his family then, valued the chance for entertainment for everyone in the opera house, on the lawns, valued public health by convincing the public to contribute $10,000 and a piece of land to William Gage to build the first tuberculosis sanatorium here. He was not afraid to be controversial. And in fact, it was very controversial to bring a TB sanatorium anywhere. Many communities turned that whole idea down and said, not in my backyard. Gravenhurst put it to a vote and in fact voted totally in favor of it. In fact, they voted so overwhelmingly in favor of it. The 697 voters voted in favor and five voted against. Remember, of course, that only men who owned land were allowed to vote at this time. He valued hard work and he surrounded himself with men who wanted to work hard. He was willing to take risks whenever the opportunity arose if he thought it was going to do some good or generate some money. And he put his own money into all of the things that he valued. So to my mind, we are talking in Charles Mickle about the man who in fact is the father of Ravenhurst. There will be many of you out there who are thinking to yourself, my goodness, there's so much more that could have been said, but I'm already three minutes past eight. <laughs> and um, I could have probably done three more or four more talks about both logging and lumbering, both subjects that are actually rather important to me. I, I like them both very much. I would be really happy to take any questions if you would like to go into the chat room and ask them. I'll certainly try to answer them um, as the best I can. So please. Ask anything that you um, think uh, you'd like to know about. Judy, can you actually see the chat there? Or do you want me to ask you the questions as they come I'm up? I'm just gonna look and see. Okay. Did horses ever get killed by a runaway sleigh? Oh boy, did they ever? <laughs> um, there, were, there were horses killed quite often, yes, by runaway sleighs. Um, in fact, as well, there were some very, very heartwarming stories about horses that survived. In one case, um, the teamster who had leaped free from the, uh, from the load and the swamper who had been standing beside him 
sort of walked reluctantly down to the place where they knew that sleigh had just gone right over the horses. You know, I mean, it was going to be ghastly. They went down and lo and behold, there was only one horse. And the horse was actually down in a great big depression in the ground. They said, whoa, it's too bad. The one horse obviously broke free and, and got away just before the load hit. And then they looked and the one in the depression was breathing. <laughs> and they managed with a number of very interesting methods. I won't discuss them here now, uh, but they managed to get that horse up on his feet and out of that, uh, that little depression in the land. And lo and behold, off he ran because he said to himself, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> so yes, unfortunately, there were a number of horses who were killed. The other message I'm seeing here is a thank you. Um, what can you tell us about the Henry King Mill? The Henry King Mill, what can I tell you about the Henry King Mill? Let me just see here if I can tell you. Henry King is not, um, a lot of people confuse Henry King with H.R. Um, King or George King, um, not the same guy. <laughs> um, in actual fact, Henry King, third guy altogether and um, not related, I think. He had actually worked for Charles Mickle um, in the past. And in the spring of 1878, he um, built a shingle mill north of the old dry dock on, um, on the bay, on the east side of the bay. Uh, I don't know a lot about him, but he didn't stay in it for very long because in 1885, this is the mill that was sold to George Washington Taylor. So if you, you can kind of see that sequence and eventually of course that would go on to be sold um, as well to uh, the Snyder Company. So Henry King didn't really stay in business for very long but we have information about Henry King in the archives and I'm more than happy if people contact me after um, a talk and um, ask if I can provide them with information, particularly when it's a relative. And I guess I'll put in a little um, pitch here and say too, if you have photographs from the lumbering and logging days of Muskoka, particularly around Gravenhurst, we don't collect history from Gravenhurst and Huntsville. Uh, we have all we can do with Severn Bridge to Gravenhurst. Um, and in fact, I did not talk about the Severn Bridge mills. There were five or six really big, important mills in Severn Bridge, the first ones to be built in Muskoka. But I thought I had enough on my plate just to deal with Gravenhurst. So um, I would be happy to see anything that you might have um, to take copies or to receive them to be kept um, and preserved. I would also welcome any questions that you have. I see here that Doug is asking, um, how many trains came and went daily during the lumber heyday? <laughs> well, are you talking passenger trains or are you talking about the ones that were supposed to be um, pulling um, logs and, and lumber? Uh, because in actual fact, I think that there were supposed to be quite a number of trains um, going. There were about six trains, I, well, between four and six trains a day for passengers. Um, I would think that almost an equal number should have been running for um, lumber. In actual fact, they would sometimes go two days without seeing a train. In the winter time, when it was snowing and the you know snow was coming down heavily, the G, the Grand Trunk Railroad, I was going to call it the, the GDR, but the Grand Trunk Railroad did not keep open its tracks or the uh, shunt lines out into the lumber mills. So in fact, they had to, <laughs> they, they couldn't have brought a lumber or a lumber train in anyway, even if they'd wanted to, which they didn't have often anyway. And the lumbermen had to go out and shovel out and clear out the train tracks so that the trains could actually get down into the lumber area. Absolutely unconscionable. I don't know how they got away with it. I know that Charles Meckel took a whole group of lumbermen uh, because he was very prominent in the lumber industry in Canada. 
and he took a whole group of people to uh, uh, the Parliament buildings in in, uh, in Toronto and talked to um, his member and anybody else who'd listen to say, what the heck is going on with the GTR? I don't think it did any good. And I hope that answers your question, Doug. Anything else before we, we say adieu? <laughs> There are still log boom anchor rings in the rock. Yes, no doubt. Um, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there are. I actually have a piece of a log boom. Um, one of the things you would call an anchor, they used to take a great big log and square it and then put rings in the log and put that standing upright in between the um, logs that ran lengthwise in the boom. And I've got one on my front porch and it actually has the rings in it. So if you're interested in seeing what an anchor ring looked like, you could actually uh, pull up in front of my house if you know where I live and just take a gander um, over at the big log boom um, piece that's sitting uh, from the Ottawa Valley, I must say, um, sitting on my porch. Uh, another one of my valued things. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Logs on the bottom of the bay. Sawdust on the bottom of the bay. Anybody recall the uh, restaurant in West Gravenhurst, which shall remain nameless, which built itself on sawdust? Because somehow somebody didn't bother to find out that, in fact, there was a lot of sawdust and logs in the bottom of the bay. And in actual fact, no, it wasn't the wood box. It was actually... Um, oh, what am I trying to say here? Um, <laughs> uh, my goodness, it's just gone right out of my mind. Anyway, the, the uh, Boston Pizza uh, is the restaurant I'm talking about. They had to rebuild that thing from the bottom up because it was starting to go down. And that was because they hadn't done their homework, uh, the, the people that were involved in the building trade, not, not Boston Pizza per se. Um, they hadn't done their homework to find out <laughs> what they were building on, which was not much. A lot of sawdust and a lot of logs before you got down to uh, terra firma. So that's a warning to all these people who think that they're going to put something in the bay. <laughs> um, and that it's going to be permanently wedged there. Anything else? If not, I will say good night, and I'm very happy to have everyone with me. Thank you for the kind comments. I, I love doing these talks, and uh, I would be more than happy to speak with anyone who has further questions later on. Judy, it looks like there's one more question there. Who is there? I'm sorry. Okay. I don't, I didn't say, oh, how about the mill at the Crador site? Or thinking of the Calador, um, out at the Calador site, yeah, there was a mill out there. There was a mill um, just to the, um, I guess we're going to call it to the south of the Calador, um, sorry, no, of the Calador, of the Minnewaska dock. Um, people who've seen photographs of the Minnewaska Hotel, which would eventually become the Minnewaska Sanatorium briefly, uh, there was a dock there. Um, it's where the old POW camp is, that's right. And in fact, um, it would become um, uh, the dock for the Minnewaska and for, for Calador. Uh, and actually there was a mill that was built just um, down from it. Um, just looking for, uh, somebody has said Henry King's mill, but no, I don't think so. This is farther up than that. Um, I have to take a, a little run through here for a second and see if I can find it because it's eluding me completely. Don't forget as well that there was some, there was a Bryden lumber mill, shingle mill out in West Gravenhurst in, in Bryden's Bay um, to, to think about. And I'm looking at, looking for the one at the Minnewaska, but it's not rearing its head to me. I have my cheat sheet here just in case. Such a question, uh, there it is, Hill Brothers. And those were the brothers of Albert Hill. Um, if you know your Gravenhurst history, Albert Hill was in fact a blacksmith 
and a man who built uh, carriages and wagons and so on, as blacksmiths often did. And it's his uh, home and business site that is on um, Hotchkiss Street um, on the south side of Hotchkiss. And it's now, I think, a real estate office. But in any way, um, he was Albert Hill. He had two brothers who built a shingle mill just to the south of the Menawaska uh, Wharf in 1879. I don't have any further information about how long it lasted or, or you know, what became of it, but that's the one that we're talking about. Yes, Snyder's Bay Road, somebody is mentioning that. In actual fact, that has to do not so much with EWB, who never lived here and probably only paid one or two cursory visits, but in fact, it's to do with Aldred, Aldred's son, Claude, and Claude's son, Bill. And Bill and Helen lived on Snyder's Bay Road. So there you go. <laughs> that was Bill and Helen Snyder. Anything else before we go? Thanks very much then. We will say good night to everyone and uh, please join me again when we have another talk to do. I won't be doing the one that was scheduled for June. Um, lots of issues surrounding health in my family right now. So um, I'm just going to have to let that one go um, and we'll hopefully work it in later on in the year or next year. Thanks, bye-bye. <laughs>